Dan Kenner took a sip of bourbon and picked up his iPad. He'd gotten a text from his wife saying that she'd be late at work again and that he should have dinner on his own. Dan was a man who liked to plan. Since the evening was free, Dan decided to eat a cheeseburger at Whataburger and spend the evening with Lee Child's latest novel, Jack Reacher, and a bottle of Milam and Green 13-year-old bourbon given to him by his father-in-law. He'd been saving the bottle until the right moment, and this evening promised to be that moment. Dan took another sip of the bourbon and set the iPad aside on the end table, savoring the 111-degree amber liquid and contemplating his current situation. Kendall, Dan's wife of six years, has been working a lot of overtime over the past six months. At the beginning of their marriage, they had agreed to put an equal amount each month into a joint checking account to pay bills and fund vacations. But their personal savings, checking, and retirement accounts were kept completely separate, and neither had access to each other's accounts. Kendall's income as a salaried employee was not increased by additional hours, so whether Kendall worked 40 hours a week or 60, her income remained the same. With separate personal accounts, Dan did not know whether Kendall earned little or a lot from her overtime hours. The amount they each contributed to the joint account was far more than they needed to cover expenses, and the balance had grown considerably. Kendall had insisted on splitting the accounts before they were married. When he and Kendall first met, Dan's business was struggling because of the bad economy, and there were weeks and months when Dan refused to pay himself. That's the nature of business. The garbage man gets paid before you do. Dan refused to lay off employees and dug deeper and deeper into his personal savings to keep his promise to himself that no one would lose their job. He went through life step by step, and as night fell, he closed his stores, and all he discovered was that he was one day older and even deeper in debt. Kendall was making a decent salary as a staff accountant at a Fortune 500 company and staying out of Dan's business. She feared his company would fail at this time and kept her at arm's length. Dan lived off savings so as not to burden Kendall, and although he sometimes struggled to meet his obligations to fund their joint account, he was always able to put his share into it, knowing that the storm would eventually pass. Dan has managed not only to weather the storm, but to thrive. The collection of three auto repair shops he had inherited from his father had grown into a small chain of 12 locations over the past couple of years. In the next three years, he had purchased options on land that would allow him to expand the chain to 20 locations. All of the stores were operating in the negative, but Dan intentionally kept his paycheck as low as possible and invested the profits back into the business. For each point was purchased tire fitting equipment capable of installing and balancing tires of any size on any type of wheel, regardless of their exoticism. State-of-the-art diagnostic equipment allowed his technicians to diagnose and fix drivability problems on virtually all vehicles manufactured in North America, Asia, and Europe. Except France because screw a bunch of Peugeots. So Dan's business was booming. Kendall's job was going well. It should have been the happiest time of their lives. But cracks appeared in their marriage. For Dan and Kendall, this was the second marriage. Dan's first wife had died when she was hit by an elderly driver during a routine morning jog. It was a clear sunny morning with a slight October chill in the air. Because of the morning glare, an elderly woman driving to her doctor's office did not notice Kendall running down the street. The city officials were repairing a damaged culvert, causing the sidewalk to collapse, and Lizzie had to run down the street about 20 feet. That was all it took. 20 goddamn feet! Five seconds of timing and two lives cut short. Lizzie didn't know it yet, but she was four weeks pregnant when she was hit by a car. It was the second instance of tragedy in the Kenner family. Dan's mother died of lung cancer when he was in middle school. She had never smoked a cigarette in her life when she developed a persistent cough and sought medical attention. Eight weeks after her diagnosis, she was gone. It was several months before Dan could begin to recover from Lizzie's death. His father had appointed an acting manager at the store Dan ran. This gave Dan time to grieve for the wife and child he would never have. Dan might never have recovered had his father not suffered a fatal coronary accident while driving home from his store in the evening. It made Dan forget his pain and focus on business. People's livelihoods depended on it. It was through a careless accident that Dan met Kendall. A mechanic apprentice removed the radiator cap without waiting for the engine to cool when Dan walked by. The hot antifreeze spurted out onto Dan's chest, necessitating a visit to the emergency room. The waiting area of the emergency room was crowded with visitors that one would find in most cities. Open head wounds, 
overdoses, withdrawal syndromes, and a whole host of injuries and traumas typical of what the ER staff called BRIs, short for beer-related injuries. The seat next to Dan was empty, and Dan himself looked non-threatening, though he did look like he'd been doused with some greenish liquid that smelled faint and unpleasant at the same time. A tall, attractive brunette, limping, ran up to Dan and lowered herself into the empty seat next to him. Since the emergency room was crowded, they knew they would have to wait. They told each other about their injuries. Kendall had twisted her ankle while jogging after work and briefly recounted their lives. There was an immediate attraction between Dan and Kendall. Dan invited her to dinner and she accepted. They became friends and very quickly became a couple. Kendall divorced her first husband because of his emotional abuse and cheating and told Dan from their first date that she had no tolerance for cheaters. They were married 15 months after they met. Dan took a sip of whiskey and thought about his marriage. How did the old joke go? We've been happily married for five years. Unfortunately, we got married six years ago. For the first few years of their marriage, Dan and Kendall were happy beyond belief. They laughed together. They danced. They made love all the time. They were good together. The problems began after Kendall earned her MBA and was poached from the bank she'd taken a job at after college to become an accountant for the Fortune 500 corporation she now worked for. Dan was supportive of her. He wanted Kendall to be happy and successful. There came a time when one of the senior vice presidents was due to retire, and the senior director to whom she reported was applying for the position. The senior director position was vacant, and Kendall felt she had a very good chance of being promoted. She just needed to show that she really wanted the job. After a few months, Dan noticed that Kendall had become a little more verbal with him. Everything he did seemed right. Kendall had become dismissive of his work. To her, he was just a mechanic now. A grease monkey. She began to disparage him during every conversation. Her constant anger and irritation with her husband was causing discord in their marriage. Kendall began working overtime to stay away from Dan. When she was home, she texted on her phone. Her phone. How he hated her phone. She was always on the phone, secretly laughing at the messages that came in. She would turn the screen so her husband couldn't see who she was texting and what the messages were about. She slept with the phone under her pillow. And then it turned violent. Kendall had always had a temper and was quick to anger. Kendall had always had a temper and was quick to anger, usually in the form of a harsh remark or a sharp barb to the object of her anger. When she lost her temper, she quickly calmed down and made amends. And when Dan was the object of her anger, her remorse led to a night of great sex. However, Dan noticed that her outbursts had become more frequent and prolonged, but without the sex that used to make her temper somewhat tolerable. A month ago, during an argument Kendall had started for no good reason, she'd slapped him. In six years of marriage, neither Dan nor Kendall had ever raised a hand to each other. But she had slapped him, and it shook Dan to the core. The slap surprised Kendall too because she immediately apologized and apologized. But then there was the coffee cup incident. A week after the slap, Kendall yelled at Dan because the oil change light on her BMW came on and he hadn't changed it. Dan explained to Kendall, for the umpteenth time, that her BMW came with a free oil change for the first three years, so it made no sense for him to change the oil when the BMW dealer would do it for free. Kendall yelled at Dan, just change the oil, asshole. Dan had had enough of this nonsense. I told you not to buy this car, but you just had to have this overpriced and unreliable piece of German crap. Now that you have it, you have to service it yourself. You schedule your own service appointment at the BMW dealer. It's on your conscience. Kendall became furious. She picked up the coffee cup and threw it at Dan's head. If he hadn't dodged, the phone would have hit him in the forehead. He stared at Kendall in shock. She gave him a blank stare, then turned on her heel and walked away without a word. Dan took another sip of whiskey. He heard the garage door open, signaling Kendall's return home. Dan picked up his cell phone and sent a text message, as well as the email he had queued up. They were duplicates, sent to the same person and containing the same packet of information, so it didn't matter which one was received first or if one of them didn't reach. Dan was a firm believer in backup plans. As Tennessee Ernie Ford sang long ago, if the right doesn't get you, the left will. Walking through the living room, Kendall glanced over at Dan, who was sitting comfortably in a soft chair with a glass of whiskey in his hand. I'm going to go change, and then I need to ask you about the strange activity on the joint account.
Kendall didn't wait for Dan to confirm her words and headed for the bedroom. A few minutes later, Dan heard the shower turn on. Both Dan and Kendall set up notifications in their banking apps for unusual activity. Dan received the same text notifications that Kendall was undoubtedly concerned about. He sighed, took a sip of bourbon, and set the iPad aside, waiting for Kendall to return. Fifteen minutes later, she emerged in black yoga pants and a white open-chested t-shirt, sinking onto the couch across from Dan. Her wet hair was tucked back after her shower, and although she hadn't applied makeup, she was a stunningly beautiful woman. Her body was slender and athletic, and her breasts had a C cup that was currently unencumbered by a bra. Do you know about these deductions from the general account? She asked. There was a slight accusatory tone in her voice. She held out her cell phone to Dan. Their bank's app was open to check the activity of their joint checking account. The balance was $12, whereas the day before it had shown over $30,000. Dan nodded his head. $12,000 charged to PDSC? That's Pendragon Security Consultants. That's to pay them for following you around for a month and documenting your affair with your boss. $18,000 ACH to the SKD account? That's the fee for Solomon, Klein, and Davis, my divorce attorneys. He took a sip of his bourbon and watched Kendall's reaction. Tears came to her eyes and her mouth opened and closed like a fish without water trying to find oxygen. Her face reddened, and for a moment Kendall seemed speechless. Dan watched the play of emotions on her face. Fear turned to sadness, which turned to anger and then back to fear. She seemed stuck, and it wasn't until Dan raised his glass to take a sip of bourbon that she seemed to decide what to say. It didn't mean anything, Kendall said. I just got involved in something I couldn't control. I'm going to end it right now. I don't want a divorce. Didn't you say she doesn't tolerate cheaters? What does that mean to you? If you ever cheated on me, I'd divorce you, Kendall said, looking at her hands clenched in her lap. That sounds like a reasonable plan, Dan said. I don't want a divorce, Kendall repeated. What do you think will happen when I find out? asked Dan. I didn't think you'd find out, Kendall admitted honestly. I thought our affair would end and you and I would go back to normal. And the disrespect? The anger and insults? Should I have just let it go? I never disrespected you. And there was no abuse, said Kendall, her voice rising slightly as she refuted Dan's accusations. Did you have sex with him in our bed? Dan asked. Kendall gasped and the blood rushed from her face. Yes, she said quietly. I meant no disrespect to you. Oh, well, that's okay then. If you didn't mean to disrespect me, that's fine, Dan said with a hint of anger. You had sex with your lover in our marital bed, in our marital home, and you don't think that was disrespectful to me? And you said there was no violence? Dan laughed sardonically. You slapped me and threw a coffee cup at my head, so yes, there was abuse. We can get through this. I don't want a divorce, Kendall insisted. We can work it out. I'll make an appointment for us to see a marriage counselor. Dan shook her head. Our marriage wasn't the problem. The problem was your cheating. I agree that counseling is necessary, but not to fix our marriage. You need to fix what's broken in you. If your boyfriend was single, you'd be out of here on your first smoke. He's not getting a divorce, so I'm your plan B. Screw the noise. I don't want a divorce, Kendall repeated firmly. You'll change your mind, Dan said with a wry smile. Kendall's phone buzzed with incoming notifications the whole time she and Dan were talking, but she ignored them, turning to Dan. When the incoming call came in, she lowered her eyes in annoyance. You should probably take this, Dan said. Kendall got up from the couch and headed into the master bedroom for some privacy. As she left, Dan picked up his cell phone toggled a few pre-opened applications, and then pressed the post button. Dan heard Kendall's muffled voice, but couldn't understand her until she spoke loudly. What did he do? A few minutes later, Kendall returned to the living room. Her face was red, and her eyes were squinted and angry. Did you tell his wife? Did you bloody tell his wife? She shouted. How dare you try to ruin his marriage? You have no right. They have two little boys. How can you hate her so much? You're a pathetic asshole. You miserable piece of shit!
I'll never forgive you for hurting her like that. Dan looked at Kendall puzzled. So you don't think he's a miserable asshole for cheating on his wife? And I'm a miserable asshole for telling her he's cheating? You're a tough cookie, babe. You don't think you and your boyfriend are miserable pieces of shit for lying and cheating on your spouses, and I'm the bad guy for telling her about it, do you? Dan shook his head and grinned. In his quest to understand infidelity, he had recently read about the twisted logic of cheaters, but to see it exemplified by his own wife was just crazy. This is between you and me. You have no right to interfere in their marriage, shouted Kendall, her face turning crimson with anger. Your boyfriend had no problem getting into my marriage, so I had no problem getting into his marriage. If he's cheating on her with a co-worker, there's no telling what kind of skanks, sluts, and whores he's cheating with. She needs to protect herself and get tested for STDs. He's not like that. And he's clean. Since the first thing you do when you get home after a late day at work is take a shower, I'm going to assume you have unprotected sex with him. You should get tested too. I got tested for my own peace of mind, even though we haven't had sex since you started your affair. Kendall looked at her husband in shock. He'd known about this for months and acted like everything was fine while he hired private investigators. Who was this man? You just wanted revenge. You're pathetic, Kendall said. Dan noticed again that her phone was buzzing with incoming notifications, which she ignored, hurling insults at him. When she paused to catch her breath, the phone rang. You should probably take this, Dan repeated, taking another sip of bourbon. Kendall headed into the master bedroom again to answer the phone. Dan dialed his iPhone and mumbled something quickly into the receiver. He then opened the recording app on his iPhone and leaned it against the lamp on the end table next to his chair. The phone was videotaping Dan while keeping the line open so the person on the other end of the line could hear what was going on. Dan sat leaning on his arms and waited for his wife to return. He didn't have to wait long. Kendall practically flew into the living room. You put that on Facebook, she screamed. You posted this on Facebook and tagged all my family and friends? You tagged Pastor Riley. Well, yes, but to be fair, I also posted it on LinkedIn so all your professional connections can see it too. Kendall screamed in frustration and anger, then threw her cell phone at Dan's head. He closed his eyes as she leaned back for the throw and braced himself for the impact. When the blow followed, it was much harder than he expected. He nearly passed out when the phone hit his forehead, but he managed to keep his composure. He knew she was going to do something, and sitting on his hands to keep from killing the bitch was one of the hardest things he'd ever had to do. Kendall jumped across the space separating them and began punching him in the face. Dan felt his lips split, and the copper tang of blood rushed into his mouth. It hit his nose, and for a moment Dan's vision blurred. Finally, he stopped sitting on his hands and covered his face with his hands as she continued to pummel him. Kendall yelled, I'm going to hurt you! I'll hurt you so bad you'll go to the other world. Eventually, Dan had had enough, and he gently pushed her away, stood up and walked a few steps away, putting the couch between himself and Kendall. If the 911 operator Dan had called had done everything right, he would only have to wait a couple minutes for the patrol car to arrive. That's exactly what happened. Kendall looked at Dan with eyes full of hatred, her chest heaving as she took deep breaths. She was trying to calculate the best way to deal with Dan. Left? To the right? Over the top of the couch? Before she could come up with a plan of attack, the doorbell rang. You should probably buy this, Dan said, his voice flat and unemotional. Kendall wrinkled her nose and squinted her eyes, looking Dan straight in the eye. She paused, then turned on her heels and headed for the front door. Kendall opened the door, and two police officers stood before her. She was talking to the officers, looking back at Dan every few sentences, her expression a mixture of confusion and anger. The officers and Kendall were too far away for Dan to make out their inaudible conversation. He saw Kendall gesticulating vigorously and pointing her finger at him. Dan saw Kendall step aside and allow the officers to enter their home. She led one of the officers out of the living room toward the kitchen. The second officer approached Dan. Mr. Kenner, I'm Patrolman Diaz and my partner is Patrolman Agnew. Your wife tells me that you've been violent toward her tonight. Why don't you tell me what's going on? Did you touch her? Dan shook his head negatively. I told my wife about her affair. She jumped all over me, 
Dan pointed to his face. He could feel blood on his face from the impact of a dropped cell phone. He could also feel a split lip. I was the one who called 911. She's gotten aggressive lately. A month ago, she slapped me, and a week later, she threw a coffee cup at my head. It got past me, but if it hadn't, I would have had to go to the emergency room. I recorded today's confrontation. Would you like to see the video? Patrolman Diaz undoubtedly wanted to see the video. Dan made a few tapping motions on his iPhone and then handed the phone to the police officer. Patrolman Diaz watched the video silently, raising his eyebrows at the scene of Kendall lunging at Dan. The policeman looked at Dan skeptically. It sounds like there was a conversation before the recording. Was anything said that could have escalated the situation? Dan shrugged. She found out that she'd been followed for a month by a private investigator and that I'd passed the information on to her affair partner's wife. She wasn't happy about it. The policeman grinned. You don't do things by halves, do you? As that guy said, I light my way forward by the light of the fires of the bridges burning behind me. Okay, Dylan McKay. The officer shook his head and smiled. His partner stepped out of the house and they conferred with each other. The second officer shook his head and nodded toward Dan. Patrolman Diaz played his partner the video on Dan's phone. His partner rolled his eyes and shook his head. Kendall's explanation was very different, but she didn't know she was being recorded. Patrolman Diaz approached Dan again. We're arresting your wife for domestic violence and terroristic threats. I suggest you take out a restraining order. Patrolman Diaz opened the front door as his partner was leading Kendall out of the kitchen with her hands cuffed. She was crying and hyperventilating. Dan, don't let them do this to me. Please, if you ever loved me, make them let me go. I promise I'll behave. Dan rolled his eyes and turned to the officer who handed him a business card. My email address is on the card. Send me a copy of the video. As the patrol car pulled away, Dan called his attorney, Dwight Solomon. It went exactly as I suspected it would. She was simply arrested and taken to jail. Just stay calm, Dan. If she shows up tomorrow, you know what to do. The next morning, as Kendall was walking out of the courthouse accompanied by her parents, she was stopped by a 20-year-old blonde man chewing gum. Excuse me, she said, stopping in Kendall's path. Are you Kendall Kenner? Yes, replied a very tired, hungry, and irritated Kendall Kenner. Who are you? You've been served, the blonde replied, holding out an envelope to a shocked Kendall. The blonde smacked her gum and turned her back to Kendall and walked away. What is this shit? Kendall turned to the blonde. I don't know, I don't care, the blonde replied over her shoulder. But I'd say you're probably screwed, whatever it is. Kendall opened the paper with anger and saw the inscription, Petition for Dissolution of Marriage. What a bastard, she shouted to her parents. The morning was not an easy one. Kendall was woken up early and taken out of her prison cell and taken to a holding cell in another part of the building. She sat in the cell for an hour before meeting with her lawyer. She was allowed to make one phone call the night before, and she called her parents, who immediately began leaving voicemails at various law offices so they could get to work the next day. They contracted with the first attorney who called them back the next morning and were confident that Kendall would be represented at the hearing. The judge set Kendall's bond at $10,000, which meant she would have to either post the entire amount or pay a bail bondsman 10% and then pledge real property as collateral. The judge also issued a restraining order prohibiting her from contacting her husband, showing up at his home or his work. She had to make arrangements with her attorney to remove her belongings from the home. Kendall's attorney objected to this, but then was shown pictures of Kendall's husband. The objection was withdrawn. After leaving the courthouse, Kendall's parents took her to McDonald's first thing. She had been booked into the Denton County Jail too late to eat dinner, and the jailers woke her up early for her morning court visit, so she missed breakfast. Kendall hadn't had dinner the night before, preferring to spend time in bed with her boss, Tony. She had planned to grab leftovers from the refrigerator when she got home, but that plan had fallen through. She wondered how she'd ended up here. She and Tony were just finishing up their second round of sex when an alert popped up on her phone. While Tony dozed beside her, she checked her phone, expecting to see a message from Dan. Instead, she saw a message from the bank about a low balance. She quickly logged into her bank's app 
and immediately saw that there were only a few dollars in the joint bank account. That same day, the account received two ACH withdrawals, one for $12,000 and one for $18,000. A Google search of the payees yielded nothing. Kendall knew it could mean they had been scammed or that the bank had made a mistake. Kendall was a smart woman. She also realized that it could mean that Dan knew about her affair and had emptied the checking account. However, she didn't believe that. She knew her husband and knew he wasn't afraid of confrontation. If he suspected her of cheating, he would certainly tell her. Dan Kenner was not the kind of man to let something like that pass his ears. She knew that, and yet here she was, lying next to her boss in a cheap motel after sex that was spectacular in its mediocrity. Not for the first time, she wondered what she was doing here. Kendall had always had it easy. She was always the prettiest and smartest girl in the class. She was rarely the most popular because the other girls didn't trust her. She learned at an early age to use her sexuality as a weapon, and it was a weapon she pulled out without hesitation. It all started with Mr. Campbell, her high school calculus teacher. She never dated high school boys. She only dated men, guys who had graduated from college and had good jobs. College was a repeat of high school. If she had trouble with her classes, she slept with a professor. And men or women, they all wanted to sleep with Kendall. She graduated from college in four years with a finance degree. She considered law school, but realized she wasn't a strong enough student. You couldn't have sex in law school. To Kendall, her affair with Tony Geyer, the senior director to whom she reported, meant nothing. It was a means to an end. If she could get some recreational sex, what her previous lover had called sports sex, in the process of her promotion, so much the better. It was during her second year at Chase Bank that she met Kyle Evans. Kyle visited her bank branch as part of an investigation into possible money laundering activities of a suspected drug dealer. Kyle was assigned to the Special Operations Division of the Denton County Sheriff's Department, and his long hair, mustache, and devil-may-care attitude immediately caught her eye. She brazenly asked him out for a drink and climbed into bed with him at the end of their first date. Two months later, they began living together. Another year later, they were married. For Kendall, married life was a revelation. She loved Kyle and wanted to do everything in her power to give him pleasure. Domestic or sexual, it made no difference. Kendall and Kyle were perfect together, until they weren't perfect. They had been married for four years and were actively trying to have a baby. It hadn't worked out yet, but they enjoyed trying. In the middle of their fourth year of marriage, Kyle was asked to go to a four-week course organized by the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Organization. Although he would be away for a month, Having the ATF course on his resume would help Kyle with promotions. The trip was a sure thing. The first week of Kyle's absence, Kendall was lonely but good. The second week was a little more difficult as the hormones combined with the loneliness increased her arousal. By the end of the third week, Kendall was crawling the walls and masturbating twice a day. In the fourth week, Kendall agreed to go out for drinks with Bill Williams. William Williams, known as Square Bill, or more commonly, Square, was her husband's former partner in the Denton County Sheriff's Department. Kendall didn't know exactly what had led to their rift, but she knew they were no longer friends. She'd accepted his invitation for a drink with the vague thought that she could help bridge their differences. Besides, he was a good-looking man and she was lonely. What could be worse? Kyle had a great performance in the ATF class. He was leading the class, which was very important because in the last week, Whoever was in first place got to take the final exam three days early. If they passed the exam, they could leave early, and if they failed, they had to stay until the end of the class. Kyle passed the exam and three hours later was sitting on a plane headed to DFW to surprise his wife. It was four in the morning when the Uber dropped Kyle off in front of his darkened house. In the driveway, he recognized the car of his former partner, Square. Kyle's heart clenched into a cold fist as he unlocked the front door and entered the house he shared with Kendall. Leaving his suitcase by the front door, he quietly made his way to the bedroom. The room was partially illuminated by the light from the master bathroom. Square lay on his back, uncovered by anything. Kendall was lying on her side, facing him. Her arm was thrown across his chest. This was how she slept with her husband. Kyle pulled out his cell phone and started filming the sleeping couple. After 30 seconds of filming, he took a few pictures and put the camera away. Kyle then walked over to Square's side of the bed, Kyle's side until tonight, and clasped his hands together, interlacing his fingers. He then raised both hands above his head and brought them down with all his might. 
A blood-curdling scream from the square roused Kendall from her dreamless sleep. When she awoke, she was frightened and disoriented. She saw Bill crying and clutching his groin with both hands. Her husband was standing over them, but for a moment her brain couldn't comprehend what was happening. Then everything fell into place. Kendall looked at her husband with a frightened expression on her face. She slowly realized the horror of what was happening. Her husband looked down at her. His face was red with rage as he looked at his soon-to-be ex-wife. I'll be back at three to get my stuff. I have to be done by six. Don't show up here at this time. I won't be held accountable for my actions if I see you, and you're not worth going to jail or losing your job. Kyle grabbed Square by the hair and lifted his face to look into his eyes. You miserable piece of shit! I'm sending a copy of the videotape to your wife in HR. You can go and quit today because your career is over, and so is your marriage. Kyle gave him one last punch to his nose, not hard enough to break it, but hard enough to make blood rush from it. Turning on his heel, he left his house in Kendall. Kendall sighed, remembering how hurt Kyle had been over her cheating. Her big, strong husband had been devastated, and she feared he would never recover. He had rejected all her attempts to contact him. He didn't want to see her or talk to her. The divorce went through and her parents supported her, explaining that it was not her fault in any way. Kyle must have been very cruel to have hurt Bill so much. His cruelty would have led to the demise of their marriage sooner or later. Her story turned into a story of neglect and abuse on his part. Didn't he show his violent tendencies when he confronted Bill? As Kendall and her parents rewrote history, making herself look like a victim, she became the hero of her story. A brave girl who did what she had to do to escape the brute her husband had become. Only once was her fiction thrown in her face. Kendall was shopping at Engstrom's in Dallas when she came face to face with her ex-husband. With him was a tall, slender woman. She had red hair and the physique of an athlete. She seemed vaguely familiar. She was pushing a stroller. Kendall's eyes widened as she saw her ex-husband for the first time in five years. Hi, Kyle, she stammered. Hi, Kendall, he replied tonelessly. She held out her hand toward the woman. Hi, I'm Kendall. I used to be married to Kyle. Oh, yes, I've heard all about you, the woman replied, shaking Kendall's hand. Kendall blushed at that. I'm sure it's no good. Some are good. Some not so good, the woman replied. I'm Corey Calloway. I'm Kyle's wife. This is our son, Kyle Jr. Kendall looked at the sleeping infant. The hardest thing in her life was keeping a smile on her face while looking at her ex-husband's new family. He's a beautiful kid. You're lucky to be married to Kyle. He's a good man. It was good to see you again, Kyle. Kyle only gave her a disdainful look, took the woman's hand, and pushed the stroller toward the men's department. A few days later, watching the local evening news, Kendall was shocked to discover that the news anchor was the same woman she'd seen with Kyle. That's why she seemed familiar. Kendall typed Corey Calloway into Google and discovered that she was a fast-rising media talent who might end up on one of the national cable news channels. Local media watchers have noted that while she's pretty enough, if not quite slutty and weak, for Fox News, her intelligence is more suited for MSNBC, though she'll have to develop a more condescending tone if she moves to that channel. For now, she's been hugely popular on local news, that night, Kendall sobbed until she passed out and every night for the next week until she remembered her fiction. Kyle was violent and emotionally abusive, wasn't he? It was only a matter of time before his new marriage fell apart, too. Kendall forced herself back to the present, contemplating how the divorce would turn out for her. After eating her egg muffin, Kendall demanded that her parents take her to their house. It's a bad idea, dear, her father told her. I need to talk to Dan. I need to explain to him what happened. We can work through this. Ken, her mother began, I don't think this is a good idea. The judge said, I don't care what the judge said, Kendall snapped at her mother. Just take me home. Kendall's parents walked her to the front door and watched her ring the doorbell. They stood waiting for a few minutes, and then Kendall rang the doorbell again. When nothing happened again, Kendall started pounding on the door. Dan made a quick phone call before opening the front door without removing the security chain. You're not allowed to be here. There's a restraining order to keep you out. I live here, Kendall said. How can we fix our marriage if I'm not here? 
Dan looked at Kendall incredulously. Fix it? I'm divorcing you. We're not fixing anything. I'm not going to stay married to a lying, abusive cheater. You need to get out of here. Dan closed the door, which sent Kendall into a rage, and she started pounding on the front door. Let me in, you cowardly bastard. You haven't seen violence yet until you see what I'll do to your cowardly ass. Open the door now! She began pounding frantically on the door. Seeing their daughters upset, Kendall's parents began banging on the door as well. As their daughter became more and more upset, their calls to Dan became louder and more emotional. Open the door, Dan, or I swear to God I'll kill you. I'll cut your heart out with a steak knife, Kendall shouted. Open the damn door, you fat monkey, Kendall's father shouted. I'll put you down, boy. Dan sipped his coffee and shook his head, watching the video from the doorbell camera. He watched as the patrol car pulled into the driveway and as two officers approached the porch. The officer spoke to the group for a minute, and then one of them separated and rang the doorbell. Dan opened the door and invited the officer in. After verifying Dan's identity, the officer asked him to stand on his side. He noticed cuts and bruises on Dan's face. Last night I told my wife about her love affair. I have proof of the affair because I hired a private investigator. During the confrontation, she became violent and attacked me, Dan said, pointing to the bruises on his face. She was arrested last night and appeared in court this morning. She was issued a restraining order prohibiting her from appearing in her home. Dan handed the officer a copy of the court order his attorney had emailed him. I have this too, Dan said, showing the officer his phone. He pressed play and they watched a video of Kendall and her parents banging on the door and making threats. The officer only shook his head as he watched them. Well, this looks pretty straightforward. Send me a copy of the videotape, the officer said as he handed Dan a business card. He then turned on his shoulder mic and requested two more cars for a few more arrests. Stay inside and watch this shit show from your phone. Don't leave the house until I tell you to. That's what happened. The officer called his partner for a counseling session. They reviewed the video on his phone and then approached Kendall and her parents, where they were informed that they were all under arrest for trespassing and terroristic threats and that Kendall was arrested for violating a restraining order. When two more patrol cars showed up, the officers began arresting Kendall and her parents. Kendall's mother became hysterical, and Kendall began crying and cursing at the officers. Kendall's father tried to push the officers away to get to his wife, but he was knocked to the ground. Shit show is an understatement. Dan called his lawyer and left a message. Just arrested Kendall and both her parents. I think I married into a family of idiots. Leroy Keyes felt defeated and depressed. He, his wife and daughter had been arrested Friday night for trespassing and threatening their son-in-law. Because they were arrested Friday night, they sat in jail all weekend, waiting to see a judge Monday morning. Leroy and his wife received restraining orders ordering them to stay away from Dan's home and business. In addition, Kendall's bail was revoked and she was to remain in jail for violating a protective order and making terroristic threats against Dan. Leroy and his wife Sarah were able to get out of jail but Kendall will remain in jail for the foreseeable future. In the back of his mind, he realized that he had failed in his role as a father when he had raised Kendall. She was spoiled, had rights, and was probably a narcissist, but she was also his little girl. His wife spent the weekend sharing a cell with Kendall. Sarah didn't want to discuss what they had talked about, but when Sarah was released, she looked angry and determined. About what exactly, Leroy had no idea. Leroy called the lawyer whose services he had used in Kendall's first arrest. After explaining the situation to the lawyer, he sympathized with Larry, but the lawyer told him he was going on vacation and wouldn't be available. This was true, but also a very fortunate coincidence because he thought the whole family was nuts and wanted nothing to do with them. Leroy flipped through the yellow pages, calling lawyers until he found one who could take him in right now. If Leroy knew anything about lawyers, that would be the first red flag. Raleigh Cruz had no idea what a lawyer should look like. Skinny, balding, with a hooked nose and small, narrow eyes, Raleigh more than remotely resembled a buzzard perched on a power line, waiting for its prey to die so it could descend on the carcass. A vague phrase from a long-ago literature class popped into Leroy's mind. Something about a lean and hungry stare. Some ambulance chasers were advertised on TV and billboards. As you went down the career ladder, some ambulance chasers were advertised on bus stop benches, 
Raleigh Cruz looked like he was advertising in massage parlors and on Fox News Channel. Raleigh smiled predatorily as Leroy handed him the business card that had been in Kendall's divorce packet. The smile was soon replaced by a grimace. Solomon Klein and Davis? What the hell? I thought you said your son-in-law was a mechanic. How can he afford an SKD on a mechanic's salary? He owns several stores, Leroy said. I don't think he really works on cars. Raleigh rolled his eyes, deciding not to rely on his new customers for information. He turned to the computer and did a quick Google search on the name Dan Kenner of Kenner Automotive. 12 dots. Nice. It looks promising. His business has 12 locations. That should bring in quite a bit of profit for your daughter in the divorce. Maybe we can get him to pay all my fees, too. Raleigh wasn't actually rubbing his hands together in anticipation, but it didn't take a fertile imagination to picture him doing it. Screw you! Raleigh looked at his cell phone in bewilderment. He had left a message for Dan's attorney, Dwight Solomon, who finally returned his call. Raleigh demanded an immediate meeting with Dan Kenner and his attorney to arrange for temporary spousal maintenance. Dwight answered Raleigh and then disconnected the call. Raleigh immediately called Dwight Solomon back, intending to read him the riot act and teach him a lesson in professional courtesy toward fellow members of the legal profession. What part of screw you did you not understand? Dwight Solomon asked without greeting or preamble. If you want to play hard, then we'll play hard, Raleigh said to himself as he put his cell phone down on the table. Why didn't you tell me there was video? Yelled Raleigh at his clients. I walked into that conference room looking like an idiot. Raleigh was finally able to get in touch with someone from Solomon, Klein, and Davis. A first-year associate called Raleigh to set up a time for a pre-conference. Raleigh's clients did not need to attend this first conference. The whole conference was an unpleasant experience for Raleigh. From the moment he entered SKD's law office until he slipped out the door, he spent a long time trying to embarrass and humiliate Roland Cruz, ESQ. It all started when Raleigh walked into the reception area and gave his name to the receptionist. He figured that if a dog turd left to dry on the sidewalk suddenly grew arms and legs, grabbed a briefcase, and announced his intention to practice law, he'd get just as warm a reception as Raleigh. He was directed away from the waiting area to a small conference room and told that someone would be coming for him shortly. Catch. In fact, she said someone had to fetch him, as if he were a stick being thrown to a dog. Raleigh sat in the small room for 20 minutes before someone brought him in. A child. Or at least she seemed like a kid to Raleigh, barely out of high school. In fact, Lauren Davis was 32 years old, a graduate of Yale Law School. Some might think that it was the fact that her father, Lawrence Davis, was a named partner that allowed Lauren to get a partnership quickly. They would be wrong. It was her inherited natural ability and aptitude for law that had made her a junior partner before her 30th birthday. Raleigh knew none of this. He only glanced at Lauren and mentally brushed her off. When Raleigh sat down in the spacious conference room, he was shocked to see Lauren take the seat across from him. There was amusement in her eyes as Raleigh began to list his client's requirements. As Raleigh listed the requirements, that amused look became more and more wolfish. They had footage of your daughter assaulting her husband. They had footage of your daughter violating a restraining order and making death threats. They had tapes of you and your wife making death threats. They had a prenup that you somehow forgot to mention to me. You made me look like a freshman student instead of someone who has been practicing law for 30 years, Raleigh said bitterly. The whole adventure had been a humiliating experience for Raleigh, and he was furious. I'm firing you as clients. Go find someone else to do your shit. And here's my bill for the time you've wasted. Now get out of my office. Kendall and her parents watched Dan from across the conference room table. Kendall had dressed to the hilt and knew she looked good. She wanted her husband to see what he was throwing away. Dan looked at Kendall in amused silence, ignoring her attempts to make him regret his decision to divorce her. They agreed to all the points of the divorce. There was nothing to divide. Each would take what they had entered the marriage with. Dan had purchased the house during their first marriage and retained ownership since Kendall had never been listed on the certificate. She felt that Dan was not fully committed to their marriage. Dan, on the other hand, saw that his subconscious didn't fully trust Kendall. In the end, they were both right. As part of the divorce agreement, Dan demanded that Kendall return her engagement set to him, and he returned his wedding ring to her.
She put the rings in an envelope and held the envelope out to Dan across the conference room. He didn't have an envelope, so he just took the ring off his finger and held it across Kendall's desk, where it sat for the entire meeting. As they stood, finishing the business that had brought them together one last time, Dan had a question for Kendall. Can you tell me why? You had a good life. I know you loved me and I loved you. Why did you give it all up for an affair? Kendall sighed and looked up for a moment before looking at Dan. I don't know. Boredom? Anxiety? Increased chances of a promotion? Maybe a little bit of all three. What do you want me to say, Dan? Do I regret cheating on you? I regret getting caught. I can't say I regret cheating or sex. It's just who I am. But you were a good husband. I just wasn't a good wife. I don't know if I could ever be a good wife. To anyone. Dan nodded. Kendall hadn't told him anything he didn't know or guess. Kendall gathered her purse and papers and turned to leave. Kendall! She turned to look at Dan, who pointed to his wedding ring still on the conference table. You should probably take this. Thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to the channel and watch for the next video.